now. Okay, so uh, first off, uh, my name's Damien. Uh, I have uh, the pleasure of uh, being responsible for our Agile and DevOps and BA purposes here in Auckland. Uh, I also have the pleasure of introducing tonight's session. Um, but before I do, uh, as I have noticed Garth, our CEO, is on the line, I better do a quick word from our sponsor. Uh, so Assurity look out, uh, is a, a consultancy business. We, we see our purpose as using our skills and experience to help New Zealand realize a better future. And, and we do that through a range of different services. We've got obviously Agile at DevOps, uh, which are two of the areas we're focusing on this evening, but also uh, business analysis services, innovation and testing. Uh, so that's a big part of what we do and why we have a real interest in, I guess, looking and learning from experts across the world. Um, so on with the show. Uh, today's session is all about banking, uh, and it's probably a subject dear to my heart, having spent a massive proportion of my career, some 20 years, uh, in banking. It is a little bit of, uh, I guess, a, a pet area of mine. And, and if I go back to um, sort of my roots and some of when I was first starting in banking, uh, probably before there was this huge focus on specialization that we tend to have in, in today's environment. It, it always amazed me about the amount we actually got done with very small teams, very, very um, collaborative, all working together, uh, really short communication cycles with um, our executives and our chief sponsors. And we were just, I guess, really just getting stuff done. Uh, and so today's environment where I see there's a lot more, a lot more regulation I find it's a really interesting challenge to sort of almost rediscover our youth to a certain degree. Um, and that's why I've got a personal interest in this particular topic. Um, so what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna hand over to Shadi. So Shadi Taylor uh, is a senior consultant in the, in the Agile world. Um, she has been herself involved in many large and small transformations in terms of Agile, uh, both in terms of banks and other industries. Uh, and has really, really broad knowledge. Uh, she has also actually been the chair of the IOBA in South Africa. Um, so she's very much well equipped to hopefully uh, wrangle this rebel. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Shadi. <laughs> Hi, thanks Damien and um, welcome everyone. As you can see just now, quickly popped off just to go turn the lights on. <laughs> it just, we in the office, we are making sure everything's ready for tomorrow. So before we continue, um, some house rules. This is a remote session. So for the purposes of making it seamless and you guys to get the best out of the session, I'm gonna ask that all participants that are not on the panel, um, officially, you might feel like you won't be part of the panel. If you're not an official um, speaker tonight, if you wouldn't mind please um, taking your video off. That will make it easier for me to see when our panelists need us to talk. So it's lovely seeing all the friendly faces, but if you could please take us off the panel, great. The second request we're gonna have is to please uh, leave your mic on mute first. I'm gonna ask you to please make use of the chat functionality. If you do wanna ask questions, we will be monitoring it and we will pick those up and ask questions. Either you can use the everyone functionality or you can send private chats to myself and um, Ling D, you'll see as the co-host, Damien, just speaking now. So we will be using that features. Is everyone clear on that? And I hope everyone understands that. And we appreciate you working with us. Just for the flow, for the first 40 minutes of tonight, we are going to listen to our panelists, their experiences, their war stories. Um, hopefully no fighting will be breaking out. Um, we'll see. I've got the power. I can pick them off the call, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so that will happen if we need to. But what we'll do is, after that, uh, if they have no other questions in between, we will then open the floor to take questions from the people in the audience. So your questions will get time, it will be answered if there's something you feel was not addressed in particular in the discussion already. We're here to have fun, we're here to share our experiences. And I hope everyone enjoys it. I'm going to stop showing the slide right now at the moment. Um, I hope you've memorized those faces. I hope they burnt into your memory and I hope they kind of look the same as the people on the screen. I was recently on a call, a remote call, where the person looked nothing like the photo on the screen and I spent half the call hoping I was in the call with the right person because of it. So I'm going to just stop sharing there. So a little bit of housekeeping on my side. So you will see that stopping now and you should start seeing our panelists kick up. So Coming from my background and my experience, I think the burning question for me would be, should 
banks even been looking at introducing Agile? And apparently that was just the one that killed the floor completely. <laughs> okay, well, that comes to the end of the panel. Thank you for everyone for joining us. We're not going to be talking any further. Now, I think um, having all the challenges and the things I've seen in banks in particular, I think this is one of the questions that have come up from a lot of people. Can it actually work in a bank? I'm going to ask Marcella. Yeah, good. I'll kick it off. Um, so yeah, good question. Can it work in a in a bank or in a organization that is active in the bank industry? I think definitely yes. Um, if you ask me, if you take a look at Agile, it's a mindset, it's a way of thinking. And therefore for me, it fits in every type of organization. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that Agile as how it is most of the time implemented by organizations as more of a way of working fits and suits every single team and department in an organization and definitely within banking it has its challenges if you take a look for finance and risk it can have a challenge if you try to implement scrum for example um, but i've been in a pretty successful transformation like ing in the Netherlands and yes it can work for a bank. Okay so now that Marcella has answered that question for us um, what I would like to do is run a poll and after the poll I'm going to introduce <laughs> you to the panelists. So you guys will be here now apparently I've outvoted there is evidence it can work in agile in a bank so we will discuss the conversations just now. You will see a poll pop up on your screen now, everyone. I'm going to ask everyone to please participate. You should be seeing it on your screen right now. This helps us to get a feel of who is in the room and what your experience has been with this. See, some people are still thinking really hard about this. If this is okay, it was a failed transformation, it was still a transformation. I'm getting the last of the votes in now. Ten more seconds remaining. If you are dialing in on a phone or on multiple screens, just tick both screens because you might not be seeing the poll in front of you right now. Okay. And the voting has slowed down. I am going to close our poll right now. And I'm going to share the results with the room. So very interesting for the people who can't see the poll. I am just going to read this out to say that out of the 99 participants we have online, 45%, um, 45, so 56% have answered they are part of the Agile transformation in a bank. They have been part of it. Uh, 26, 33% have said in other industries. And we've got one person that's about to embark on one. And eight people have said to us, no, never. So why this panel? Why this panel and why these people? Let's talk about that. First of all, I'm going to introduce them. I'm going to ask them just to wave when I introduce them um, so that you know who they are. So the first person up will be Kylie. Kylie, Hi. would you mind giving a vote? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so we're very, very lucky to have Kylie um, with us here tonight. Kylie currently is a country manager for a company called Frivolu Solutions. And they develop innovative technology solutions that power the world's leading financial institutes. This is a recent um, company that she's joined. So Kylie comes from a wealth of leadership experience and um, positions in the bank prior to that. She's worked in customer experience, corporate strategy, business development, and has successfully led transformations in local Kiwi banks. Um, in addition to that, as there was not enough punishment, Kylie <laughs> has spent seven years in um, banking institutions in London, where she also 
went through a lot of uh, experiences there. I can imagine the war stories. And um, amazing, this was really impressive when Kylie shared this with us. In 2018, she was awarded the Prime Minister's Business Scholarship, which enabled her to go to Stanford University Graduate School of Business Executive Program. So we are really honored to have Kylie on the panel tonight, bringing that wealth of international and local experience. Thank you. Welcome, Kylie. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to ask Marcella, who I threw under the bus with the very first question, <laughs> who bravely stepped up. I'm going to ask her to wave and introduce herself. Hi. So Marcella, you might have recognized there's a bit of an accent there. Marcella is one of our Dutch consultants. She's a senior consultant. She's been in the Agile space over seven years. And she initially started with Scrum Master and IT teams very quickly moved on to the product owner role, where she combines a lot of the traditional roles to help them to lead and deliver in more of an agile way. So she's experienced as an agile coach in both IT and non-IT industries, and she has led transformations for a lot of corporates. She will mention some of those, you'll definitely recognize it, quite famous transformations. <laughs> and currently we are very fortunate to have a, a board of us. She's coaching leadership and executive teams, as well as personal coaching. She's a very pragmatic coach and her main focus and passion is the mindset of a framework. Welcome, Marcello. Thank you, Shadi. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Next up, we've got Bartwin, keeping with the Dutch. Yes, <laughs> you will hear the accent there. We have another Dutch guest on the panel. And um, Bartwin, as he says, he's a change consultant and entrepreneur at heart. He also has run successfully his own businesses, his own companies. And he has a very diverse background as a consultant and coach. Most recently, part of a quite a large, um, extensive um, agile transformation in a bank called Rubberbank, in International Bank. It's a Dutch bank, or rather international. Um, so he's fresh. He's, his war wounds are fresh from this one. Um, <laughs> last but not least, we have Mispa. Mispa, wave. There we got it. So Mispa is an agile coach with a broad banking experience. Um, she was the Agile Transformation Lead. She actually led up all activities in the largest bank in, in Africa. And part of her role was developing sustainability with an Agile capacity and looking at areas such as the ecosystem of procurement, HR, legal and governance structures. She also has a lot of expertise in the Atlassian tool set and using that beyond tools to help organizations to use them for good reasons and to create transparency across layers. Welcome panel, we look forward to dealing with you. So my first question is, um, and I'm gonna open this to the floor, to say, how did you approach transformations? How did you embark on this thing? All of you have been part of quite large transformations. Um, how did these transformations kick off? I'm gonna ask Bartwin to maybe kick us off. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. And also I would like to, to add there the beautiful lighting on my face, either making me cast for the friendly ghost or Donald Trump. <laughs> either, either, either way is fine. <laughs> Just as uh, to go into your question there about agile transformation, I think for most of us, it's, we've been asked to enter into a agile transformation that's already ongoing. So it, it, at least that's what I think. Um, I was asked uh, to be part of a natural transformation that was already running. Uh, and I think that's also part of the difficulty in trying to uh, make the quickest impact because you have to get first a sense of where the transformation go, the choices that have been made, especially in a bigger company. Uh, I think that's one of the main challenges before you start off uh, impacting on, on the floor. Esther, you've got something to add? Yeah, so to, to share how we um, started off our transformation. Um, at that point, we were owned by a different bank that was actually operating out of the UK. And they had embarked initially on an agile transformation. Um, and when they bought uh, the bank over, they basically said that we also needed to go on this agile transformation. So it was more of a directive um, then, uh, yes, this sounds like a good idea. We, we should go agile for the right reasons. Um, initially, it started off in, in, in IT, which I think is quite common for agile adoptions. Um, it was owned by our CIO. But I think because it started in IT, 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 
it set up quite a couple of challenges going forward in the transformation. Um, we often found ourselves getting quite stuck with Agile being seen as only an IT thing um, and therefore uh, almost limiting what we were able to do from a business perspective and the rest of the organization. Um, so that was the, the beginning stages. We also went on um, an initiative of, of training everyone in IT upfront on, on what this new Agile thing was. But the fallout of that um, ended up being that the people actually were quite frustrated because we didn't really have the support structures in place just yet. Uh, leadership hadn't really thought through creating teams or, or how we would create the feature teams. We didn't have any external consultancies or any coaches in. At that point, also the South African Scrum Master market was quite scarce. So there weren't a lot of Scrum Masters in the actual, um, in, in the market. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of help when we started. And by just training everyone as a blanket approach, it created a lot of frustration because ultimately people were trained in this new mindset, but they couldn't really do much with it uh, because there were quite a lot of factors that inhibited that. So yeah, that's kind of how our transformation kicked off. Okay, so this agile in IT concept, Kali, does it resonate with you? Did you see this in New Zealand? Um, so um, our starting point was um, that we wanted to be a customer experience lead organization, and we knew that adaptability and agility could enable that. Uh, once again, we had a really strong um, um, agile focus in both um, tech and digital. So that was um, the starting point for that. But we wanted um, to, uh, to bring it into the organization to ensure our people could make better decisions and deliver more effectively through a flexible and adaptable network of teams to achieve those better customer outcomes. So once again, uh, very much focused on the longer term vision, but the starting point was um, in the technology and the digital spaces and then brought, then introduced into the business end. Mashallah, and for you? Yeah, um, for me, um, I, will, I will take ING because I think most people know ING uh, also from the transformation point of view. Um, what was remarkable when ING started their transformation was there was no uh, particular financial imperative. The company was doing great, actually. Um, but they uh, recognized that they wanted to be the coolest software IT company to work for that were occasionally working in the banking industry so instead of saying we want to become agile they had a really strong vision um, what was working pretty well is that ing managed to focus on it first because they mentioned if they wanted to have a successful transformation of their business they needed to support their uh, products and their uh, software as well for that. So if they wanted to um, come up with new products really easy for the customers, they needed to have a great IT infrastructure to make that happen. So what ING choose to do is they combined IT marketing and product management all together in the transformation, but they left out finance, risk um, and HR, for example. Um, those departments came later on during the transformation um, involved in the whole organizational structure. And that was really key for, for ING and I think that was also because it was from top to bottom. Um, Peter Jacobs, the CIO from um, um, ING, he made it really clear what his vision was and he made it really clear that everything in the organization needed to change. Um, which made it really strong, actually, for a good start up for the transformation. Mm. It's interesting. And so the focus is not so much on let's be the most agile company in the world. The focus is normally driven by other things. Um, Ms. Bar, I know you said the, the directive was given from the top. Um, so the kind of focus was to say, like, be agile. But I think if we look at success and we look at stuff like that, the most successful transformations I've certainly seen has not been driven at trying to achieve agility. It has been trying to achieve that customer experience or adaptive um, way of approaching things. On that note, my next question would be, we talked about leadership here and being driven down. What do you think is needed from leadership to make a transformation successful? Mashallah, can I ask you to pick that one up for us? Yes. Um... 
What I've seen um, uh, in multiple banking transformations and um, in other industries as well is from a leadership point of view, uh, there tend to be a lot of focus on getting ways of working in there. Um, and if you ask me, um, leadership should way more focus on an organizational structure that supports becoming more agile in the way of thinking and the way of working. Um, so focusing on clarities on roles, clarity on um, expectations, responsibilities, and governance, um, and having a really strong vision where they want to go with the organization um, will help employees and staff to figure out how they can contribute to the transformation instead of just doing it because it's told that they now need to use a scrum board in order to make it faster um, mm -hmm. so i think there is a big key for leadership to focus on more the overall wrapper of a transformation and more organizational structure than deep dive into how are we going to adapt scrum well, that's interesting but i thought it was all about speed Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> okay while well, you True. think about that Bartwin, you wanted to add me and mr i see you yeah, I want to add at least for sure, uh, it helps when leaders keep reiterating the why of the transformation. So it's it's key and important to the people to know, like, why are we involved in this transformation? Why is such a ask being made of us? And at the same time, leadership should also focus on the goals, show them this is the goal we're working towards. This is uh, uh, why we're doing this. And then finally, I would say uh, data. So some kind of key results, some kind of data to show that you're on the right track is, is really overlooked, I think, in a lot of agile transformations. So I think that's definitely something leadership should be keen on. Okay, Ms. Bo. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I think um, having an executive sponsor is incredibly important. And Marcella, you, you mentioned that, you know, came from the CIO, CEO and, and they bought into that. Um, and I think although we, we had a top-down directive, um, the level that it was owned at was, was potentially not the right level. Um, I think we, we need a lot more executive sponsorship to actually fight for, for um, agility and, and so that it's not just handled as another agile project, a project that needed to be executed and done, but actually understood that this was organizational transformation. This was enterprise wide. Um, and therefore we need to be having conversations at the right levels to start shifting the things that need to shift as part of that. Um, so I think executive sponsorship, but also role modeling. I think um, when we talk about what do we need from leaders, I think to actually role model the change um, we often had feedback um, of people saying to us, well, has my leader been on this training? Um, has my, does my leader understand Agile? Um, you're putting us through these courses and, and training us on what Agile means, but ultimately when we go back in the office, we're told to just carry on as usual. Um, so there's no bind to actually making the change work. Um, so I definitely add role modeling to that as well. Kali, would you agree? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the term that we use quite a bit is to lead the change, you need to be the change. And it absolutely needs to be role modelled and led from the top. Um, and just building on Bartwin's point, we, were, we need to be really clear on the why um, and taking people on that journey and being able to tell the story because that's really where you're going to get that, you know, um, sort of buy-in and engagement and that reason on why we need to change and what really needs to be different. I also think um, leaders need to decide how far, how fast, and what tools and techniques and what sequence needs to be right for the organization. So um, it's really clear on the pathway forward. Okay, so Bartman. Yeah, um, I wanted before to. You con yep. Yeah, before you continue, so someone has asked us if you could please elaborate on what you meant by data when you were talking about data. Oh, excellent. So what I mean with data is that. Um, let me just exaggerate the point a bit. Sometimes people say when we're going to be agile, everything becomes fluid. So there is there is no real guidelines. We just do as we feel because it's agile. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we need to, to uh, reinforce a different stance and help um, to understand that if you want to be agile, some, some, you can't change everything at the same time. 
at, at once. So I think from leadership perspective, it's very important to, to reiterate also what Kaidu was, was talking about, to make a decision on what you're gonna change first and what's definitely not gonna be changed right now in order to make that, to, to keep that stability happening. Uh, and when you look at the data and, and, the, and the key results I was talking about, it's, it's very interesting to show that if you are making a transformation, you're doing something different to show data-wise that the transformation is having an impact. So even on client contact or uh, the, 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 um, the way that, that people connect with you uh, on a regular basis than they did before or usage of your apps that you're trying to put out or any kind of data, that shows you're on the right track will help at least to uh, solidify the first steps towards your transformation. And which data points are, are different to each organization, maybe to each technical level or strategic level. But I think it's very important to keep those data points there and to also monitor to look whether or not this change you're executing is actually having a benefit and an added value. Yeah, I think the valid point is that, that this data, I think a lot of teams will do measurements internally on the team and they'll look at the maturity of the team and agile practices perhaps. But I like the point of pointing out that it's more than just that. It's you don't go into transformations just like we said earlier to make your team the most agile team in the world. While you certainly do those health checks on the team, you still need to see if it's actually having an impact on your customers. Um, on that, I find it very interesting that most transformations are feel uncertainly. Definitely, same pattern. It's been driven from the IT perspective. So my point is, for it to work, can it really work if IT is the starting point or the main focus point? And how do we go about breaking out of this, especially from a culture perspective? How do we start moving this to a full organization and not just another thing that IT is doing? Um, can I ask my own MISPA, would you like to start us on that one? Yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned, we, we started with, with quite an IT focus and as a result, it was quite difficult to move out of the stigma that Agile was just for IT. But ultimately, we were trying to embark on business agility, so enterprise-wide. Um, and it meant that we needed to start having conversations with business and to start breaking that silo down because um, ultimately we're, we're trying to create these product teams and understand the end-to-end -end value stream. Business is absolutely part of that because they're our connection to customer. So it was quite fascinating for me to actually observe that, that happening where it was IT versus business rather than us collaborating on getting that, that going. But those conversations started to, to happen when we engaged with business on the benefits that, that they would see. Um, of how working in shorter feedback loops would mitigate risk. Um, but as a result of those conversations, we also then started moving more into finance conversations, more into HR conversations, um, to understand that also the way we're in incentivizing our teams um, or incentivizing people at that point, and not necessarily looking at it from a team perspective, was hampering what we were trying to do from an agility perspective. Um, we also then started having conversations with marketing and so it, it, it naturally organically started to flow out. But I, I think having started with IT in the beginning um, also created a stigma that was very difficult to, to break and took a lot of effort and um, it was quite painful to actually get past. Mashallah, I see you nodding your head there. <laughs> yeah. yeah um... Most of the transformations uh, start at IT, and I, I get that. Uh, there's nothing wrong, actually, with it, as long as you keep in mind that if you want to change your organization, you need to change your whole organization and not just a part of it. Um, yeah. What I think was, re was really inspiring around ING, they spend a lot of time and effort to actually understand what it meant. So they did site visits to Google and Netflix, Spotify. They, they had a lot of conferences and stuff to just find out what it is. And they kicked off their transformation um, on IT site. But the thing that makes it really interesting is that it wasn't a, just a IT team. It was a product-focused 
transformation. And with that came channel marketing, uh, channel management, product marketing, um, all that stuff was entitled to change. So that was like a huge part of the organization already who changed. So it wasn't like business was still running their own show and IT was doing their own show. They made sure it was done by products and those products were adding value for the customers. And it was really logical that those two worlds work together. Um, so they spent a lot of time in, in trying to figure out from a customer experience perspective, what were those key product areas that they needed to focus on. From that point, they started to look at organizational structure and stuff. Um, the main departments around it, so from how I saw it was more the wrapper of the departments around it. So like HR and finance um, and risk, they were not involved in the transformation, but they were agile. They weren't working according to the same frameworks or the same ways of working that the transformation was doing, but they were focusing on getting the knowledge up and running for their employees. So there were a lot of trainings done. They were, um, they were part of sessions and events that ING hosted internally. So that everyone was getting on the same page, like this is what we want to achieve. And although you're not officially part of the transformation, you will become part of our organizational change. And therefore they had a long time to just see, okay, what's working? What kind of processes do we need to support? What kind of processes do we need to change? And especially for HR, for example, which is a department in a lot of transformations and organizations that struggle to become agile, um, they got a really quick, clear view on what kind of processes they need to have in place in order to facilitate and support a self-organizing and, and almost human-centered organization. Um, so a lot of the stuff became clear when they became part of the transformation. Um, yeah, I, I think I would like to echo the point of, of spending time into a transformation. Um, the things I've experienced and seen is that, of course, or of course, many of the times, transformation starts off with the IT. Uh, when they say development and operations should be put together and, and, and that start off with that point and then some success comes from this and then we put into that the business as well but rarely do they spend the time to acknowledge that you are putting three different blood types together as it were and and how these three different squads would work together is is uh, the real challenge i would suppose so on a bad day the business people would say listen this agile stuff is just for it people right so we needn't bother with that and then the IT people would say, listen, those business people don't give us any clue on what we're supposed to build. So we're just going to work from a backlog, I suppose. So I think there, that's the real challenge there. If a company is willing to embark on this transformation, also to have a realistic approach on how much time and effort should we spend on uh, the why and how much time and effort should we spend on what does that mean within the context of our teams between business and IT? Yeah, and that sounds to me like it comes down to the good old culture and mindset. So it's that whole culture and mindset that is so key to everything. Um, with that in mind, so what do you think um, does the role, how, how relevant or how crucial to success or failure is culture and mindset in the transformation? Kylie, I know that this is an area that you spend a lot of time in. Um, and yeah, um, so um, mindsets and the culture are the foundations of any transformation you're embarking, embarking on. Um, early on, we identified um, the key mindset shifts we felt the organization needed to make. And we looked globally for best practice um, to identify some key um, themes. So some of the themes were um, customer obsession, uh, things like pace over perfection, uh, trust and um, transparency um, were some of the themes that of the key shifts that we need to felt that we needed to make right across the organization um, to ensure that 
there'll be mindsets and culture shifts along the way. Um, but that doesn't mean we needed to keep on reinforcing those at every point and just taking people on the journey um, with us as well and making sure our leaders were role modeling those. Mr. I see you nodding your head. Yeah, for us, culture and mindset was everything. Like, I, I don't even know how to articulate it. It was just everything that, that we looked at kept coming down to, to the mindset and the culture that we had. Um, in the beginning, I think it was quite difficult to, to get everyone to understand that the, this was broader than just an IT thing, that this was actual organizational change on an enterprise level. Um, so to start sh shifting that mindset to that. But as we were embarking on our agile transformation, we ended up um, moving more into, into a strategic place. And as a result, we brought in a head of culture. And the head of culture actually had experienced agility before in the previous company. And having that prior experience and knowledge of, of what agile feels like, having such a senior um, executive who had experienced it actually helped us bring that to life and start seeding how changing the way of working and, and changing the way we collaborate together and changing the way we um, engage with our customers started to become quite pervasive in all the culture work that started happening. Um, so, so that was really great. And I, I think it also just highlighted again how pervasive an agile transformation is in terms of culture. Yeah. And talking about culture and change, I know this is um, at the heart of Botwin. He is our culture and change agent. <laughs> so it's here. he has to say on it. Well, the Not thing is, hey, Not uh, important. <laughs> well, the thing is, you want to make sure that, that you don't uh, overemphasize culture and mindset because it sometimes tends to be a fluffy term in which you set up a certain range of key values, which sound great, but at the same time don't work at the work floor for anybody, just so it doesn't mean anything. So culture and mindset, obviously very important. How are you gonna break it down into something practical for a team or for leadership is very much the key. So if we say it's important for us to have respect, which I think nobody can disagree with, what does it actually mean to us? Would it be disrespectful if I'm five minutes late to the meeting or if I don't deliver my stuff on time or if I don't communicate with you guys? Or So what would that in practicality mean? And I think that would, to open up that discussion with your people would actually be the greatest benefit that you could choose. And you'd be surprised about what people think of or what they feel like could be part of the success of a transformation in their own mindset and in their own culture as, as a team. So this is uh, the human element of it, that you mean the mindset and the culture in that. Yeah. One of the things that really was a battle for us, I found, and I'd really like to hear your takes on this, is as much as you've got the human element and you're fighting that war and you've got all the challenges there, because this is a bank, traditionally, banks are quite large, and because they're quite large and quite old, a lot of the banks, um, as institutes, you deal with a lot of legacy. So uh, it's legacy and mindset and culture, but it's also legacy in terms of um, infrastructure, of systems and all of that. And I hear a lot of the banks you mentioned, or if you mentioned earlier, your main driver were things like being responsive to your customer, being innovative, um, starting to move through this disruptive world. How are you managing to do that in such a huge organization with such legacy things holding you back? Um, Kylie, I, I don't know if you'd like to pick up this one for us. It's called. Yeah, um, so I think um, all transformations have to deal with some of the legacy or heritage issues um, that um, the organization has. So I, and once again, it's really understanding um, what the blockers are, where are the barriers, and taking each part of the organization on the journey and recognizing things will modernize over time. But I, I think the key thing is um, don't get ready, get started. And as you work through um, what needs to be um, evolved and improved will, will inform part of the organization. So um, I wouldn't put that as having legacy. Um, 
systems and infrastructure as a barrier to transformational change. I think it needs to be steered into and um, just need to um, understand what you're going to focus on first to overcome. Yeah, so um, I think this is a typical question where there's no one correct answer. Um, what I've seen is that um, ING made a really clear decision to keep the legacy um, software uh, teams out of the transformation scope. Um, so their whole banking software was uh, running on legacy software and it was the backbone of their organization. So turning that off was basically shutting them out of business. So that was a really clear business decision that that wasn't the case in changing anything of that. So what they did was um, the part of ING that was um, involved in the transformation, they were looking for new systems, new platforms, new software that would enable to deliver quicker and more efficiently to the market. But on the other side, the legacy software was still running and those teams were supported in everything that they needed to keep it up and running but they were challenged as well, how they could change that legacy uh, environment the best way possible in order to get more flexibility in there. And of course, everyone understood there was a level, there was a, like a limit on there for what they could do. But by the time the um, transformation flowed into a more natural way of working, those teams were able to create a um, stronger platform, which then by the time I left, um, it was the topic of discussion, how are we going to transfer from the legacy software towards the new software? And they did it gradually. And I think um, they're not there for 100% already, but they have managed to transfer a lot of their software into the new environment. I think that is key what Kylie says as well. Don't let it hold you back. Um, it is going to be a challenge. It's going to be a pain in the ass. Um, but, uh, but it's also really good to if you actually see the change and if you actually can make it happen. And then your organization is going to change so fast when you do that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so the, I think Jumping in on one of your favorite topics, uh, Charlie, is uh, healthy product management here. I think that that's one of the key takeaways to look at legacy of systems. Um, and at the same time, I was thinking legacy also means non-IT stuff. So you could also see like previous attempts at transformation, uh, previous change management, previous uh, pri priorities, goals that were set and not met, all that piles up into a legacy as well, which is a very real obstacle for any new transformation to, to be a success. Yeah. So given this, I missed that. You want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think when discussing legacy, that's also where pragmatism needs to come in. Uh, so when we dealt with legacy teams within within the bank. Initially, we got a lot of resistance. Um, they saw Agile as a phase and a fad, um, and basically leave us alone. It's never going to work in this space. And I think they were right. If you if you just go in with a very dogmatic, um, scrum by the rule book approach, uh, which is what had happened before. So I think with legacy, it's it's more about the agile mindset, the agile principles and values um, and bringing that to life. And it can absolutely still work in a, in a legacy space if that's what you're focusing on, um, is bringing the principles to life and not just following Scrum, for example, um, to the T. Talking about these principles, so one of my favorite principles that I like working with is cross-functional teams. Having this concept of teams that have got all the skills that you need to live in your team versus banks, let's be honest about it, and banks are not unique here in the sense, where you've got these siloed teams where knowledge is power and there are more empires being built and people yeah. create their careers and their whole being and life is tied into their titles. How do you go about untangling that and putting together these cross-functional teams? Yeah. 
Um, Marcella? Um, yeah, I think um, I, I was part of a really cool um, thing, um, how ING did it, and, and ABN Embro as well, uh, to be honest. Um, we have a tendency to think that we know best as management or leadership where people need to go and in what sort of teams they need to go in. Uh, so we try, if we have the question, how do we create cross-functional teams? There's a lot of leadership who dive into a deep analyze of everyone and every single product and then come up with these amazing teams. And then suddenly people just don't want that. And that's all weird and you can get a lot of friction. Um, what I saw as a, a solution in, in multiple organizations is having the product owners send there. So like what Bartman said, product ownership is, is key, uh, whether you call product owners or, or any other title, I, I really don't care. Um, but having a strong product vision, um, they stood in front of the whole group. So where there were like 150 employees. Um, and they, all the product owners pitched their vision on why their product was so cool to do and what the vision on the long term was. They set some boundaries like how many people they need in a team or what kind of special skills they needed in order to get that product up and running. Um, and then they had 45 minutes and every single person of that 150 uh, people um, just made their own decision. And yes, there were situations where there were 20 people standing and one product owner and the product owner mentioned, I need six people. But something funny happens. People start to talk about it and start to share why, okay, why do you want this? And why do you think this is a better match? And then suddenly people just left and said, oh no, I, I think another product is also really cool to work on. So they let it completely self-organize. And by the end of the 45 minutes, all groups were settled. And what was really strong in that approach was the commitment of those individuals was so much higher than you can ever reach if you manage to create your own team because you think as a manager or a leader, that's the right team. And I think that's so key in order to do any sort of change, whether it's in banking or any other industry. See, Bortwin nodding his head and agreeing there quite strongly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to, to, uh, to issue a, a, a few remarks there. I think the key question here is for any company to talk about and, and visualize how do we generate value for our clients? How does this happen in our company? So what's that mean? The input, and then output, and then what's what's stuck there in the middle, and and how can we maximize that? And pretty soon you start thinking about this cross cross functional idea because you need all these different components in order to make that value happen instead of those silos that you had before. Um, so then the idea of obviously of communication is 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 very good, and I would like to add to that that you would need to also have a, a retro retrospective a sort of an update on that so i've been at a an insurance company which they did a similar process as marcelo was just pitching which worked out fine until like two or three months in they were saying like listen it, this doesn't work or i had an other idea when i stepped in or I, I i was on a holiday when i came back on holiday suddenly i was in the cross-functional team so you would like to leave some room there for inspection and adaption like very agile way of thinking. And finally, um, I would like to add that in at uh, Rabobank, what I really did like there is that we used a maturity model. So do not start off with this whole idea. It needs to be perfect from the first step. Work in maturity phases. Just look for yourself, discuss among your leadership with your team. Like what would, what would these first phases look like? What would these cross-functional teams would have as a basic in order to deliver that value and how can we support that in order for them to reach that value? Yeah, I think often from leadership and banks, um, like you say, they, what would that first look like? Go and go to perfection. Um, I've observed it being quite hard. Your banks traditionally, because of the nature of the field they work in, people's finances and a lot of security in that, almost seem to have a, a fear to risk 
and to innovate. How do you guys feel Agile can help banks by gaining the Agile transformation, not risk their reputations, but being still allowed to innovate within that space? Kylie. Um, I think um, if, if we think about innovation in um, speed to market um, as the foundations and driving customer experience, um, adaptability and agility is the backbone. I think um, obviously banks have got a number of regulatory restrictions at the moment, uh, which you, we're hearing a lot about. And I think we need to establish the guardrails which the teams need to work within and be clear about those. But if we think about regulatory change, um, it's just a combination of BAU, and we also need to be thinking about regulatory change as quite customer experience led and innovation. So it's a perfect um, opportunity to feed that, that, that type of work into squads to think about it differently. So from a, um, on a BAU and a change front. Um, and I think more innovation will come from those cross-functional teams than doing it through a divisional silo. So I think there's a great opportunity to think about it differently. Esther, I know you had quite a few um, challenges when you guys are working with this, reputation being key of it, and having that leadership showing that they're not risking people's homes and savings. Yeah, and I, I think part of that was, um, in terms of experimentation, is recognizing that the processes um, and the regu regulations are there for a reason. They're not necessarily the bad guys. Yes, they can slow us down, but they're there to protect. Um, so what we started then doing was bringing in governance and regulation up front. So when we kicked off projects or, or product teams, we would bring the, the regulation guys in up front um, and get them to almost talk us through what are the kinds of risks they're trying to mitigate. Um, how do we set up our, our product backlog or our project so that we automatically start mitigating those risks? Because in the past, what would happen is they would be the gatekeeper. We'd be working super fast trying to get these items out and would get stuck with governance. Um, they'd be the gatekeeper and we'd take six months to try and get something through, through those um, loopholes. So, yeah, a way around that was to actually engage them up front right in the beginning to understand what are those risks that we're trying to mitigate. Michelle, would you like to add to that? Yeah. Um... I think a lot of organizations are, are scared for doing innovations and especially in banks because it needs to be such a secure environment for customers uh, as well. So um, just like when you have in, from an individual perspective, if you have anxiety, what helps for that is starting to laugh that creates a, a, a downgrade of your anxiety and that's what i've seen in a lot of organizations as well that fun element for creating for example a hackathon or um a innovation week i've worked for a really large um insurance company in the netherlands they had every six months a five-day innovation week where everyone could just pitch like i have an idea i don't know if it works but let's take five days and let's make a prototype and test it with customers um, it was so much fun and the investment that the organization made was so um, completely not realistic to what the outcome of that innovation week was. There were teams who came up with a product that initially a year later got a profit for almost 2.7 million euros. And they just came up with it in those five days. And that is kind of like the start if you're looking to do something different, but you find it a bit scary at that fun element, make it a bit more relaxed and see what you're capable of. I think don't underestimate what your organization can do. And don't underestimate the power of leadership to create that space for that to happen. Gordon. Yeah, it's a good point to, to harp on the uh, leadership there because uh, I would like to make the point that it's often the leadership who is fearful of innovation. It's rarely the teams that are fearful of innovation. So it's an interesting point to ask them what are the innovations that you feel and definitely ask the product owners um, what do your clients want. So what's the innovation that you see in the market for your clients? How many times do you talk to your clients, get feedback from them and see uh, what the bank can do to serve them better. 
presenting. So I'm going to run another poll here right now. I'm going to ask if we can just do another poll. Um, people who can't see the poll, I really apologize. We will read out the answers again for you. So everyone, I am launching a poll on the two for us here. And then we're going to start taking some questions from the audience. Okay, everyone, you should see the poll now. You can start vote for us. I still think see, we people are really thinking place. about this one. Yeah, this is a hard <laughs> we one. Need music it's a this. tough one. <laughs> I, I can see people are really thinking a bit more about this. Did you Why not sign up I... for homework tonight? I see. Why that. can I not select everything on this list? <laughs> I like yeah. to everything. <laughs> I, I see questions from people. They're saying I think it's a mixture of all comments, and you're absolutely right. Yeah. It is. <laughs> and and it, depending on your organization, probably will be depending where you are as a company, <laughs> we'll have a higher focus on one of them. Good comment, so, Rob. I like it. <laughs> so there are no wrong answers, right? So I'm not getting booted out by you, Charlie, because I gave the wrong answer like that. That's You clicked well, on dealing with scale, but that's definitely wrong. Well, when you suddenly find yourself outside of this, um, <laughs> disconnected. So while we're quickly waiting for the last few answers, yeah, I'm going to ask that. So you mentioned the dirty word scale. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Didn't I? Let's kick that off quickly. Sure. Should you scale? And when do you as, scale? As, as a proper consulting coach, you should always say it depends. <laughs> 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 but it does depend on the level of success you had at the, at the uh, smaller level. Because if you have not the basic set in, in, in the foundation set right, basically like any builder can tell you if you have no foundation set right then the rest you're going to scale and build on top of that is really going to crumble so that will be the first one to do and then the second one would be make a proper planning like how are we what areas is going to be affected by the scaling and what does that mean for us in our context for us as a bank instead of just pulling out a framework a scaling framework off the shelf and just throwing it into your organization first. I see a lot of um, heads nodding there now, Mr. And I've seen a very interesting one here um, raised. I'm going to raise it now. I know we haven't opened the floor officially yet, but someone asked a question and said, is scale like the Spotify model? <laughs> I'm going to put that out there and I'm waiting for all the face palms and all the things. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, Mr. On, on that wonderful note, um, I knew this is going to be a controversial topic. Um, so let's pick that up. Yeah, so I think just to add to what Bartwin is saying around um, really understanding the, the, the scale and the impact of it. Um, I, I've often found that when you're talking about a bank, the sheer size of it means that scaling is already implicit in the conversation. So it's really tough to talk about a one team um, element in, in, in something the size of a bank. Like there's always going to be extra context um, around it. But what I did find is when attempting to scale and, and just choosing a framework like Spotify or, or Safe um, and just adding it in there without actually spending time on the foundation. And by foundation, I mean understanding whether the team actually has the mindset going. Um, are the team able to break items down small enough? Are the team continuously reflecting and doing retrospectives and continuous improvement? If you're not spending time on the foundation, what ends up happening is you're just adding extra layers and, and scaling crap, basically, because your foundation hasn't really been set in place. So you add this framework and you create this picture and get everyone on that and you've got release trains, um, and all those elements, but when you actually go down into it, the, the, the team are dysfunctional. Um, they're not operating well. So I think it's important to also just make sure your foundation is in place. Um, before just just adding scale for the sake of scale. Yeah, Kylie, are you are you going to come in now and say that's all nonsense, Spotify all the way? <laughs> I, no. I just want that before I meet you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like I think we made um, Batman made the point. I think every context is different. Each organisation and their guardrails. 
um, will be different and what their tolerances are, but completely um, agree with um, establishing really strong foundations because if the foundations are there, you're not going to scale and it's going to be really, really difficult. And I think just applying the agile principles of, you know, starting small, iterating, learning and improving on each iteration and scaling that way um, sets the scene really well for how to successfully scale going forward. Yeah. And the reality is just often because of the sheer sizes of banks, they don't have the luxury of deciding, are we going to scale or not? So they kind of forced into that situation like a lot of large companies, so it's not that. Um, we have touched a little bit on the Spotify model. Is the, do you think a company have to follow a specific framework? Do you have to go safe, Nexus, less, Spotify? Do you think that you have to? <laughs> You've, you've got to do the right thing for your right organization and you've got to co-design that with the people in the right context and it's got to be right for you. Yeah, that's a very, yeah. very important point. Um, if we look at that second poll's um, results, it's quite interesting. Um, the, the came through for people who can't see the poll. I'm sharing the results right now. So we asked what was the biggest challenges. So the one that came up the strongest um, at 30% was culture and mindset. The after second strong is not surprising me was leadership. So leadership came up with 28% and then dealing with scale came up as 23%. And they're off to silos and other. Although silos, I must be honest with you, like someone said, I feel like they're all linked. It is linked. So silos is very often linked to culture and mindset. And again, informed or enforced by leadership. So that it was a hard poll, this one. Okay. So we're going to start looking at a couple of the audience questions now. Great. Make sure we've got that. Um, some of the questions, we, we feel they have been addressed in other questions you will see that we're not asking them directly. If you feel that your particular question was really not addressed properly, you are welcome to pop it in chat again. So before we go to some of the targeted ones, um, so there's a question here in particular that came out um, that said to us, this is an interesting one for me. Are there any aspects in a bank which makes it easier for an agile transformation as compared to other industries? Not per se easier. And I, think. And I suppose and this is the first time I've read the, the words easier transformation and banking in the same sentence. Yeah. So I was, that's why I'm so drawn to it. Yeah, my gut Get reaction is no. <laughs> I can't think of anything that makes it easier, actually. Maybe in, in 10 yeah. minutes. I, I think it, it, it's the same. Every organization and every industry comes with their own impediments and challenges. And combining that with your traditional ways of working, whatever that is, and your culture that you have that fits that traditional way of working, that makes it a challenge no matter if you're a bank or a software organization or a marketing consultancy or whatever. Um, mm. Yeah, really. I think people tend to confuse the fact that there are so many banking um, transformations by thinking that it's because it's easier. I think just because of the nature of the size of their business and trying to stay relevant, they normally, and they've got bigger budgets um, yeah. often to be able to go on these things. So yeah, when things like that. this, yeah. So Bartman, if you want, you can um, pick that one up. Well, I was gonna mention that they definitely have more uh, more budget behind them to, to at least not uh, be scared away of a transformation of that magnitude. Uh, I think what's interesting with banking is that they are, are realizing an accelerating pace that their client is changing and that their industry is changing as well. So from the traditional type of banking, we are moving and transitioning into more digital, of course, but also into different competitors that are also uh, uh, for digital payments, let's say for PayPal or, or Google Pay or, or all kinds of different competitors. They are very uh, 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 forceful. So for them, it's, it's, I think, almost a necessity to look into how can we adapt a bit quicker? How can we uh, deliver value a bit uh, clearly? And I think that's also a part where why, why banking as an industry has been taking on these transformation at a, at a bigger scale than other in industries. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about these transformations. Another question that came up that was 
something I've experienced, and this is across all organizations, but especially in banks. Um, where or who should hold the transformation torch post the initial phase? Because I think the perception often is there of people like, we've done this initial ramp up, we've trained everyone, we've done desk drops and we've got everyone excited on this train and then what now? How do we sustain this? Hire us? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was, people, I'm going to just mute myself. <laughs> No, I, I think um, a lot of executive teams and leadership teams that I've been working with um, try to point a team or a person in the organization who needs to hold that torch. Um, most of the time, it's actually the person or the level in your organization that you won't expect who is going to be the most impactful for your transformation. So it can either be a few teams who are just really excited about it and want to do everything about it to make it happen. I think whoever is passionate and clear about that, the goal that they want to achieve from the organization, they, they need to hold the torch. So share it, make more torches, um, get more in there. Um, but I think it's not one person or one role or one part of your organization who needs to hold it. It is an organizational change. It's not a team change. And if, if that is the key, that it's all good, but then call it an IT change um, and get them up and running, but don't call it an organizational change if you're not willing to go there. Yeah. Important. The interesting part here is that you'll be a uh, uh, sort of knee-jerk reaction would be like, that's leadership, right? The CEO should be that person. But the reality is that you're talking about a mindset change here, which should involve everybody in your or organization to work. Uh, to what level that mindset should change? We're talking about the maturity of change here is, is on the table, of course. But I would definitely... Um, point out that it's it's all about you at the end you need to believe that this transformation is benefiting uh, the gen generation of value it's benefiting the culture it's benefiting the mindset of everybody and that includes the strategic so leadership yes but also the tactic level and also the operational level and there is again i think the 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 proper point to make here is that you do need then these key value indicators to show that you are on the right path or you are on the right track and that that leadership is paying off. And then, of course, like Marcella is saying, you should spread the carrying of the torch to everybody involved. Yeah. One of the nicest stories I've ever heard about this to put in perspective to say is you cannot treat a transformation like a diet. People are under pressure or come out of lockdown. They're going to go for that donut and that fat white with extra sugar, they're gonna go for that. If they think they're being deprived of something and you're holding something back, then there's stress in the system, they're gonna to go to that. A transformation should be about adapting a healthy lifestyle, not withholding stuff, but creating almost rewiring your organizational DNA. So it's not a point of someone needs to carry a torch afterwards, it becomes a way of being at your core foundation. It doesn't risk on one department, one person carrying this forward. Um, that's one of the nicest ways I've ever heard this described going forward. Um, Michelle, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I saw a, a question uh, popping up, which was, um, which is a question that I, I get pretty often is, would it traditionally be an agile coach or scrum masters holding that torch? Um, what, what I, um, try to to uh, put into the engagements that I lead is that it we're not looking for roles to step up we're looking for people to step up and it can be a developer it can be a tester it can be your CIO it can be a HR manager it can be everyone um, and it's not really related to a role because if it was, that would mean that every agile coach or scrum master you have in your organization are all the same. And we clearly know all that it's definitely not the case. And therefore it's not role related. It's really people related. Like Bart Wynn was mentioning, it's mindset change. It's people related. 
and not roles. Mm. Okay, now a particular question here, and I knew when you said this name, it was going to trigger quite a lot of interest. We <laughs> have some questions about ING, hmm. very famous case study, obviously. Um, <laughs> Michelle, I'm going to combine the two questions here for you. Yeah. So the first um, half of it all was asking, what were some of the things that ING actually did to bring HR to um, the Agile mindset and mm -hmm. way of working? And then um, the question there was, yeah, so it kind of combines three questions for this. I said here, can you describe the role that HR plays in enabling the change and where there are pivotal points where they can make significant improvement to the foundation? So it's that combination of the how you guys actually implement some of it and yeah. where HR should be playing that role. Yeah. Um, what was ma HR did, did a lot of stuff, but uh, what was major is that the whole performance management cycle that they traditionally work with wasn't suitable for the self-organizing uh, environment that they created. Um, so ING flipped everything on performance management. So instead of a manager taking care of that cycle, it was now done within the teams. Um, people needed to ask team members for feedback. Uh, they use all sorts of tools. They were able to use surveys. They were doing interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews. They were holding events in order to just look at where, where we're standing. They did a lot of stuff. They kept it really open on how people uh, wanted to understand how they were performing individually. Um, and they came up with, HR came up with a structure in maturity of uh, team members instead of um, you're good to go so that's why you get a uh, upgrade or a promotion or more money or whatever um, they focus no more well if the team is um, responsible for adding value then the team is also responsible for making sure that everyone contributes and performs on that level that they want to achieve uh, so they focus on that a lot. I think that was a major thing that HR changed. Um, so that was key. Um, I know I, I wasn't part anymore of the complete HR uh, transformation. What HR did at that moment was part, not them being part of the transformation, but them being supportive for the transformation. So it wasn't their own transformation. Um, so that's, that's one thing I find really key uh, and I think that is most of the time really important. The key thing why it works better at ING than for example um, um, the ABN AMRO and Knopp Bank, which is a tinier bank in the Netherlands, is that they didn't kick it off straight away on the same day the transformation kicked off but they waited for a longer time to see what people actually needed and how they actually could support it. And from that point, they changed procedures and, and processes and stuff. Yeah. And what was the oh, third wow. question? I, I couldn't hear you properly. So the third question I think ties into that. So the person was saying that they acknowledge the fact that everyone knows that this is a quite a, like they call it the trophy case of enterprise agility in the financial sector. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and they were saying, but um, obviously not all went well. And I heard you say that before as well, mm. initially. And uh, they were going to say, so what are the key um, early lessons learned that we can uh, avoid um, by adopting Agile Scale across the bank? So what I'm going to ask maybe is just to hold that one. Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you guys when we, or as we go through these, just to wrap up. Um, in closing, I'm going to ask our panelists to all share maybe some pitfalls and some key lessons learned that they can give you as a takeaway from this transformation state in Northern. Yeah. Um, one thing I heard here now that Agile, Agile, before we move on, just something. How do you think, um, we know, we all know this, you, you get the behavior you measure. So how does Agile and Agile work together with this rewarding of behavior and, and measuring of people's performance? I mean, this wonderful thing we all want to speak about, like performance management and getting up these things and all of that. How do these two come together and get managed in a big organization like a bank? Ms. Pa, do you want to take this one? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we, we, we actually got to that point. We, we had lots of conversations between trying to decap, decouple performance and, and reward um, and how to actually do that practically because ultimately if you want the team to self-organize and to achieve goals, you also want them to share in the rewards of being able to achieve those, those goals and rewards. 
Um, so we didn't necessarily get to that point yet. We ended up going back to um, an older HR structure. We did initially dabble a bit in, in um, team performance, but I think trying to apply it over 42,000 people um, was the big challenge. And what were the different contexts that we needed to consider in different places? Okay, Kylie, would you like to add to that? Yeah, we were um, at the same point. Um, we knew that it needed to be steered into. Um, we don't have the answers, but knowing that it needs to evolve and what does that need to look like? So still in um, early phases. Okay, Botwin. Yeah, maybe a bit of a practical example. Uh, the maturity model that we were working with for the teams had like uh, an incentive, if you will, if you had reached that phase or the end of that that particular phase you were in you were to give like a short presentation to the rest of the department on these different um, uh, requirements of that phase and if everybody was agreeing that they were seeing the same things that you were uh, presenting uh, then you would get a bit of budget i think it was like uh, 750 euros or something like this to spend as a team and the only rule was that you then had to show at the next department meeting what you had done with that uh, financial board as a team. So you get a team outing or anything like that, or you bought something for the whole work floor, like anything like that. So that was like a practical more uh, incentive. Um, but if, if you're talking about being rewarded for like performance management for the job that you're doing, I think that's an important obstacle to mention when you're talking about also scaling because you have issued all these new roles in your in your organization and how are you going to reward them for doing that role exactly so if somebody was a business analyst first and then becomes a scrum master how would that actually uh, work out in the in the books so that was a, a, a very big obstacle to take on for hr and then in turn you could see that also being a bit of a stifling factor for the rest of the company because if you were looking into this role of scrum master product owner or whatever role that was there then immediately the question would become like all right how will that impact my career and how will that impact my 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 pay pay grade okay. thanks for that so final thoughts Pedris. um i've got some people contacting me saying thank you very much for your time as well uh, they have to drop off early. I think everyone's overexcited and getting ready for level two in um, New Zealand. New Zealanders. Yeah. I know we've got an international audience. Um, so I think they're excited. So before we have too many people going off, um, maybe final takeaways, thoughts, lessons learned, pitfalls, anything that you would like to share that you can give people to use it. Um, Kali, would you like to go? Yep. Um, so um, there are a number of organisations um, locally and globally um, grappling with how they can become adaptable, more adaptable. Um, there's no one way. It absolutely needs to be fit for purpose for the organisation and done in the right context. Um, probably um, a lesson learned is don't get ready, get started and fix forward and really apply the agile principles to the whole transformation would be from my perspective. Okay. Um, don't make agile the goal. Uh, I think that it's a really clear one that that will set you up for failure if that is the goal. Um, and don't think or try to change everything at the same time. Um, I'm a stronger believer of trial and error. Uh, just, just make it smaller, see what works and what doesn't, and then think about how you can scale your transformation. Um, and be aware that agile is a mindset and there are a lot of different ways of working in that mindset. And it's not just only the frameworks. It can also work with an Excel can also work with it planning um, but still be agile in your mindset so I think that are three key things for me that if you want to take it on focus on that Mister, thanks for sharing. this one yeah I think some some lessons learned to share is um, be very clear on the why and make that visible across the organization um, I think having an executive sponsor that helps role model but I think also recognize role modeling starts at all levels. 
um, each person needs to role model the change that they want to see and not simply just point fingers up and say, okay, leadership is not doing this. Um, we, we need to recognize that it takes everyone to, to do these kinds of things. Um, and I think also don't ignore the ecosystem. I think we, we did for quite some time and, and it ended up stifling quite a bit. And, and when I say ecosystem, I mean the periphery elements that help the teams actually move forward, like HR, like marketing, like governance, like legal, um, like procurement. Um, don't ignore them. They, they also need to be going on the journey with you, perhaps not in the same way, but um, when we're talking about business agility, it's across the board. I see Marcella forgot to add something. <laughs> well, I, I just want to add like um, a particular the stuff that I was telling about, I think um, shows like it's all perfect world and can be done really perfect. There is absolutely no organization and no transformation that I've seen or heard of that is from the start 100% successful. Don't let you be fooled by all the cool articles and interviews <laughs> you read online. It's, it's not all unicorns. Um, the change that you're going to do, whether it's in banking or it is in another industry, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. There are going to be a lot of moments where you just think, what am I doing? Why are we doing it? Um, the thing is, you will get uh, successful if you get over that hurdle. If you actually, at that moment, say, okay, so this is now our struggle. Let's get together and go for it and make it happen. That is where the successful transformations come from. The organizations who have reached that point and said, okay, we're kicking ass. We're going to do that. The 40, uh, the 74% of transformations that are failures, those are the organizations who stop at the moment when it becomes hard. So that's, the only thing it's not really a pitfall but um i think that that needs to be key mm. to understand that keeping going when it gets hard mm. i see that you completely um broke what was hard there when you talked about the unicorns not being real <laughs> so but yeah. now that all right. hope is destroyed for you <laughs> what is your final takeaways you. that's that's a tough one to take I think I would like to echo uh, what was Ms. Pa was saying about the ecosystem. You need to be aware of that. I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, so I would add three things. I would say uh, you would look at product management. So how do we generate value to our clients and what does that mean for us? Uh, I would also uh, look into or get sorted a, a data-oriented approach. So looking at the transparency inspection, adapting to that, very important to have some key measurements or key data points in place and finally i would look at leadership how do they look at this transformation what are the goals that they want to achieve with this transformation and set those priorities straight and please keep to those priorities thank you so much for our panelists and we've got a comment um i just want to say to people who might not be able to read it there's a comment made by someone in chat to say that small wins gains trust in the process for the organization to adapt. And that's it. It's exactly. getting these incremental wins, celebrating them, making them known. Tell your story. Tell it internally. Don't wait till you go on the stage and be the trophy for the wall. Your people need to hear it first. They yeah. need to be aware of it. Mispa is going to add some more for us. While you add this, Mispa, I'm going to just launch our final poll um, while you're chatting. And well, I, I think I, I just also wanted to add, um, initially I mentioned when we embarked on the transformation, there wasn't much help available, but we also didn't involve a lot of help. Um, and I think that was also why things took longer than, than they should have. Um, so I think a pitfall and a key takeaway as well is get help if you need it. <laughs> uh, there are people that have been through these yeah. kinds of transformations before who have um, experienced those pitfalls. Um, who can help guide you and navigate you through that and um, don't feel that you you need to crack it and, and get that get it done yourself um, get help if you need it basically yeah very good thank you for that Damien I'm going to hand over to you right now we'll right. still have to pull up until it's finished so <laughs> I'm handing over to you Hello, thank you very much Shadi and uh, just on behalf of everybody here who's been listening I'm sure I'd I could just like to take the opportunity to thank all our panelists. So uh, thank you very much to Bartman, to Kylie, to Marcella, 
and to Misba and of course to Shadi for doing such an excellent job of, of wrangling the troops. <laughs> uh, I guess for me, I, my, my key outtake is Agile does need to be Agile and that really says we just need to learn from our experiences. So hopefully, hopefully everybody's enjoyed learning from other people's experiences. Uh, that's what it's all about, sharing experiences and that way hopefully you can avoid some of the pitfalls that other people have, have experienced themselves. Uh, so just as a bit of a closing, um, we will actually send out a bit of a feedback form. So if you don't mind taking some time out um, just to give some feedback, uh, we'll actually put the LinkedIn details of the panelists as well. If you want to reach out, uh, perhaps you might have some follow-up questions for them. Um, if uh, you do have anything else that's a bit more general, feel free to chuck them through to me as well. Uh, but from that point onwards, uh, normally at one of these, we'd, we'd break for drinks about now, but that's ain't going to happen. So we'll <laughs> Come on. break and let you guys get on with your dinner. Uh, we've obviously got level two tomorrow. So everybody just be safe, take care, and thank you very much for attending.